And I'm, I'm, I'm actually going to touch on how do we fight. And it's, I think that's important. How do we fight? Uh, what we would all think it would be this big, brave guy. We put up a video clip of, what's that, 300 or um, Spartacus or Braveheart. You know, that's how we think of fighting. And I just want to, I think, it, I think there's an element of that. But I think the real fighting in God's kingdom is very different to that. And I just want to take us through that and just touch on that a little bit today. If you don't mind. I'm just going to pray first. Father God, we thank you for your multifacetedness, Lord. We thank you that you are like a diamond that sparkles, Father. And the light that shines out from you, Lord, hits us, every single one of us, in a different place. Because you meet us in every single different place that we are. Thank you for that, Lord. Father, I pray you'd come down now, Lord, and Holy Spirit, come and speak to us. Quietly, determinedly, in our heart of hearts, Father. In Jesus' precious name. Father, I pray that there wouldn't be confusion of the word as it goes out, Lord. But that it would come back and render much fruit, Father. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. All right. So I'm going to be going into fighting, yeah. So it's probably a bit predictable. I've got two sons and a lovely wife. Thank goodness I've got a lovely wife because the two sons may not have been around if it wasn't for the lovely wife. <laughs> so just to, you know, as a bit of an introduction... What is fighting? You know, we, we, we think about it and we're fighting for our inheritance. So I, last week I was at LTT in Joburg. Oh, sorry, the week before. And I read the Bear Grylls book. You all know who Bear Grylls is. This macho guy who dives off cliffs and survives the Arctic and deep sea. He's a, he's a hang glider fighter pilot, a deep sea parabat, a bit of a mixture between the two. Um, so I read his book. And you know, Bear Grylls, how's this? He was an outdoor boy. He, he, he loved going for a run in the rain with a pack on his back with 20 kilograms in it. You know, he says he's a different guy, all right? Somewhere along the line, he decided, okay, um, he, he wants to try this SAS selection, special air service selection. So he goes and he does this thing, and he, how's this? He, he, he fell out, he was thrown out halfway through the first selection because he didn't make it in time. He didn't give up. He, he was exhausted, but he was a couple of minutes late, so they said to him, out. You didn't make the time, you're out. They came back to him in a month's time and they said, okay, you can, you can try again. But you don't start where we left you. You start at the beginning again. And he went back and he started again in the beginning. And if you just hear the hectic stuff they go through, the all-nighters that they pull, the, the amount of weight that they've got in their backpack, it's like 25, 30 kilograms, and then it goes up to 35, 40 kilograms, and they expect it to lug the stuff around for 24 hours in rain, si uh, rain sun, Shine, snow, it makes no difference. Okay? And, and they've got to also flop their route and whatever else. He was given a second chance. The second chance that he took happened in winter time. All right? So it, it was pretty much different to the first half. The first half was in summer. It rained a lot. The second half, it was winter. It snowed a lot. That was the only difference. <laughs> but it was quite a considerable difference. It was just temperature. So why am I, why am I bringing up Bear Grylls? Well, I'm gonna just, let me just get to the end of the story on him. After that, he, he went on some missions with them and whatever else, and he's, he, he, was, he was selected for SAS, and he, and, he, and he worked with them. He was then doing some parachuting in southern Africa somewhere. I can't remember exactly where. And he broke his back. He had a snarl up on his, pla on his um, canopy. He didn't cut away, and he fell on his back, on his reverse, uh, reserve chute, and broke his back. He fractured his back. He was lying then in hospital thinking, how is he going to recover? Um, and then he had this picture of... Everest. He then proceeded to get better, and then he went and climbed Everest. He was one of the youngest men to climb Everest. At the age, age of 23, he climbed Everest. So let's just put this in some perspective. 18, he went on SAS selection. He then went on some, some, some ops, and then he broke his back. And by the age of 23, he made it up Everest, and he made it all the way to the top and came down again. Then he became Bear Grylls. Okay? He got a bit fat and lazy and ugly and flabby. He looked at his life and said, what am I doing? And he went and he did this whole Bear Grylls thing. But by the age of 23, he had lived a pretty full life. But why am I going there? I'm going there because I, when I was reading this book, I just got some sort of idea of, once again, of, of the preparation required to be a soldier. You know, and some of the things that came out of that were how, how preparation was so key 
on an individual level, not as a team, as an, on an individual level, they had to go and prepare so well. The next thing that came out was this endurance and this perseverance. I mean, he, he failed the selection, he went back a second time, and he persevered right through to the end. And these guys nearly die in this thing. It's, it's not like, it's not play play. It's, it's all night, all day, all night, all day, and then they're halfway. And then it's all night, all day, all night, all day, and then they, at the end, and then they get three hours sleep. You know, it's, it's quite hectic. But it's endurance and perseverance. They were ready for anything. Okay? And then team was a bit important, but primarily it was how we're preparing individually. Pre team was important. They cut some corners in the selection process as a team. If they got caught cutting the corners, they'd get thrown out. But team was a little bit important. So I thought, okay, well, that's cool. That's their grills. Um, who do I have to compare to? So I went to David's Mighty Men. And you go to 1 Chronicles 12. You can read about David's Mighty Men. These guys, it speaks about them, and I'm just going to, I'm, I'm taking most of the reading today out of, out of this message Bible. But I just want to read a little bit about them, 1 Chronicles 12. They were armed with bows and could sling stones and shoot arrows, either right-handed or left-handed. So they could sling an, a stone with the right hand, and then, my goodness, imagine, Lee can do it with the left hand, because I think that's what you are. But I mean, to do it with the right hand, without hitting yourself in the head with a stone. You know, or without the arrow going in the wrong direction. They could do this sort of thing. Um, later on, they speak about they were seasoned and eager fighters who knew how to handle shield and spear. So they were seasoned, they were determined, they were eager. Their faces were like lions, it says. It says, eager fighters who knew how to handle shield and spear. They were wild in appearance, like lions, but agile as gazelles, racing across the plains. They were ready for anything. They could use either arm. You know, I think, and so I thought, well, well, this is all cool, you know. That's great. So my question is today is how prepared are we for this fight? You know, it's not, and, I, and I'm going to get to the to a bit of scripture that I'm going to read just now out of, out of the message, but it's not a wishy-washy fight. It's not a children's athletic meeting that we're busy with. It's not the father and son egg and spoon race. It's not the three-legged race where you can pick up your son and run to the end. So this is a serious, this is a serious war we're in. You know, and, and I don't want to fear anybody. I don't want anyone to say, well, am I going to make it? We'll get to that just now. It's just, I read something about John Piper. And John Piper said, when you suddenly realize that the extent of the war that you're engaged in, you suddenly realize how important your prayer is. It just throws a different perspective on it. You know? And we'll get to that just now. So I, I went from this little bit of a background now. These guys need to be prepared. They need to have endurance and perseverance. They need to be ready for anything. And team is quite important. Right, so then I said, okay, Lord, well, now take me somewhere. What, what can, what's the, how does this apply to the Christian walk? So obviously I went to where we all go. I mean, we all go to Ephesians 6. We say, hey, that's the armor. We just point that on and we're cool. No problems. So I just want to read a little bit on Ephesians 6 out of this message Bible. And it, it touches a little bit on what I said now. now. And that about wraps it up. God is strong and He wants you strong. So take everything the Master has set out for you, well-made weapons of the best materials, and put them to use so you'll be able to stand up to everything the devil throws your way. Now I get to my little athletics contest. This is no afternoon athletic contest that we'll walk away from and forget about in a couple of hours. This is for keeps, a life or death fight to the finish against the devil and all his angels. Be prepared. You're up against far more than you can handle on your own. Take all the help you can get, every weapon God has issued, so that when it's all over but the shouting, you're still on your feet. Truth, righteousness, peace, faith, and salvation are more than words. Learn how to apply them. You'll need them throughout your life. God's word is an indispensable weapon. In the same way, prayer is essential in this ongoing warfare. Pray hard and long. Pray for your brothers and sisters. Keep your eyes open. Keep each other's spirits up so that no one falls behind or drops out. You know, and I just thought, that's, that's it. It's, it's, this is important stuff. We're not, we're, not, we're not fighting a maybe war. I know in this church right now, there are families who are under the cosh financially. There are families and people whose health has been attacked. There are people whose relationships are, are being attacked. I want to say now, I really believe the reason for that the reason for this is what I see an increase 
of this sort of thing is because I believe the devil doesn't want us to move. He doesn't want us to go forward in this fight. He wants us to fall aside. He wants us to go left. He wants us to go right. He wants us to backtrack. Or he wants us just to stand still. And God's saying, no, no. The reason the devil's against you is because he doesn't want you to take ground. This morning, the, the highlighter thing came up with Nick. Nick walked in to, treat, uh, to, to prayer this morning. We prayed before the meeting. And he said, he just got a picture of a highlighter. We then carried on talking. And then he brought, he said, he came in here this morning and he just wanted light. So he opened the curtains. He wanted light to stream in. At prayer over here on the side, one of the other girls stood up and said, yeah, she just got this picture of light. Now, how much more does God have to say about letting the light in to our lives, about when the light comes in, the devil flees? Darkness can't be where light is. How much more does he have to say on one Sunday morning, within half an hour, for us to listen and say, hey, he wants light to come in? You know? So I think he's talking to us all the time. But, and, and this light thing just came up. And it's, why is it there? Because... The devil is opposing us. It says there that it's not a baby war. This this is a fight to the death. It's a knockdown, drag out, free for all, which we need to survive. It's not. It's, it's, it's not a. Uh, it'll be okay. Uh, things are right. Uh-uh. This is souls. It's people's souls, and the devil doesn't want them to go to heaven. The devil wants them in hell. And and we need to realize that. So, so I looked at these the waste. The chest, the feet, the overall the, the, the overall, the shield of faith, the head of salvation. And I just chose three, three things that I, would, I want us to look at this morning. And, I, and, and it's the sword, which is the word. It's the, stand, it's the standing and it's the praying. So, so you might ask, well, Wayne, why, why did you choose those three? Well, I chose those three because, you know what? The truth, if, it, if I'm saved, the truth is with me. I'm redeemed. So it's something that God, God has done for me. So I'm, I'm saved. I live in truth, I fall out of it, I come back into it, but I'm saved, I'm going to heaven, so it's, the truth is, God sorted that. The righteousness, I'm in right standing with God because He saved me, not because of anything I do. Uh, the gospel of peace, thanks man, I've got it. It's a gospel of peace, but I've got it. I didn't do anything, I've got it. So then I thought, Lord, I need to do something. The shield of faith, that may be one area where I, I, I could have developed further on, but I, I, I chose not to, I didn't have time. Okay, so... Then the head, the salvation, I've got that. But God gave it to me once again. So I was looking, what am I doing? So that's why I took the sword. So I took the prayer. And that's why I took the standing. And I just want to go through that a little bit today. So the sword, I dig the sword. Because you know what? At least I can fight back. Well, at least I can take the first shot. You know? My dad, I, I grew up and my dad, he always said to me, he's a bigger, and he said to me, man, if you're going to get bullied, and like, I was this, in matric, I grew this much. So before that, I was about this height. So before that, I was only this big when I was in standard nine. Everyone thought that I was like in standard seven. I had a colors blazer, so they knew that I had to at least be in standard eight. <laughs> so, but I was a smaller. So my dad said to me, and that's why I like the sword. My dad said to me, Wayne, it doesn't matter how big the O is. If he's giving it and giving it and giving it, just get one shot in. On his nose, in his throat, somewhere. Just, just get one shot in because then when he, he's going to beat you to a pulp. Anyhow, he's not coming back next time, though. You know what I mean? So I like the sword. I, I just, it's, hey Lord, I, I, at least I can attack. You know what I mean? I, and, and so let's have, a look, let's have a look at this sword. So we go to Matthew 4, and we can, we, we can read it. But it's where, it's where Jesus is, is, is tempted in the, in the desert. And he's, he's now been out, out of food for 40 days, food and water for 40 days. The devil comes in, and he, and he comes and he takes him low and hard immediately. He doesn't he doesn't dilly-dally around this thing. He doesn't say, oh, how's it, Jesus? What's going on? How are things going with you? It's like, hey, come up to the top there. I'll give you all this. Hey, turn these stones into bread, into bread like, and, and, and it's all yours. Hey, jump off here and it's all yours. And what does Jesus do? He doesn't go to his mates. He doesn't rely on, on, on God's relationship and intimacy with him. He doesn't get down and pray. He takes the word straight away. Four, three times he quotes straight out of Deuteronomy. We will not live by bread alone, but by every word that flows out of the Father's mouth. Okay? So straight away, it's like, imagine you're getting attacked. And, and those guys, some of us have been in the army, they teach you to put this rifle together under the bed, under the water, in the mud, in the middle of the darkness, you can put this rifle together. So that you can, you can arm yourself in like 30 seconds, you've got something to shoot back with. 
Jesus does exactly the same thing. He's got the word inside him. It resides in him. It echoes in him. For 30 years, he's been preparing as a man on earth. Not as God Almighty, as a man on earth, he's been preparing and learning the scripture. So when the devil comes against him, straight away, he fires back. It's not, Lord, what should I do now? No, 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 Lord, you've said to me this word is what, what I can stand on. You will not tempt the Lord your God by jumping off this, this hill. You will not go and worship somebody else. You worship God only. You will not turn these, this bread into, these rocks into bread because I do not live by bread alone. He, it's, it's seated deeply within him. That's my, my cry today, is that that's where we go to. I really do. I, I cry for that. I cry out for that thing that, that, that with our faith, we go and find two scriptures and we learn them and we, and we seat them in, in our psyche, deep within ourselves. When it comes to our salvation, we go and find two scriptures and we, and we remember them and they're seated within us. So when the devil comes against us, we can pull these things out and say, bang, bang, you're dead, goodbye. That's, that's what we're called to do. When we're worried about health, we go and find two scriptures and we, and we learn those scriptures. When we pray for somebody, those are the scriptures we bring. We call on God's word, we stand on them. When the, when the devil wants to come against us and it's security, we can stand within scriptures that we have on security. When it's scriptures within finance, we can go to the, those scriptures and say, Father, we stand on these scriptures. But there's got to be a hunger within us. And I'm just saying, if Jesus could have that hunger for the word, where are we? If he needed it, where are we? Go and remember those, those scriptures. So that's the first thing I, I, I would call on us. Let's go and remember scripture. Let's go and memorize it, seat it deeply within us so we can use it as a weapon. The next one, I think, you know, I think sometimes we, we read the word and it seems to be same old, same old. Yeah? The joy of the Lord is my strength. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. And you just like, it becomes a bit stale and, and whatever. And I, there, there, there's, a, there's a, a verse in, I just want to turn to my notes, I think it's a verse in Isaiah 40. Um, so I'll make sure. Isaiah 45, verse 3. I will give you the, I'll give you the treasures of darkness and the hordes in secret places that you may, know, you may know it is I, the Lord, the God of Israel, who call you by your name. So he's going to go and reveal to us secret stuff that's hidden away. So we're going to go back into the same old scriptures, John 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world. Go and take that thing apart. For God, the Lord of the universe, so loved. He had so much love. He's compassionate. It speaks about a heart of compassion. It speaks about a characteristic of God. Go and pull that thing apart. That he loved the, for God so loved the world. Not some of us. Not the black O's. Not the white O's. Not the Indians. Not the coloreds. Not the Chinese. It's everyone. He loves the whole world. That's the all-encompassing nature of our God. But go and pull those things out and make them new again. This is what it's saying. I will give you the, the treasures of darkness and the hordes in secret places that you may know it is I, the Lord, the God of Israel, who call you by your name. Go back. Relook at what you think is stale and old. Just an interesting aside. That particular scripture, Isaiah 45, verse 3, is delivered to, to Cyrus the Great. Okay? So who was Cyrus the Great? Cyrus the Great funded the rebuilding of the temple. Now these ladies, I know some of these ladies from... From, from Daniel are going to trip me up here. I'm sure of it. But, but anyhow, from <laughs> he, he funded the rebuilding of the temple. But you know how he got the money? Nebuchadnezzar before him had a follow-up guy. I don't know who it was. These guys will tell you. There was a guy who came up after Nebuchadnezzar. And Nebuchadnezzar didn't want to give him the, didn't want to give him the, the treasure. So Nebuchadnezzar makes a, makes a boat, puts treasure in the boat, Digs a hole, puts the boat in the, in the, in the ground, diverts the Euphrates River over this, this hiding place. So it gets silted up. So no one's going to get that treasure. God directed Cyrus the Great to open that part of the river and get the treasure to reestablish his temple. That's what Gill's exposition says. Don't have a look at it. If you don't believe it, come and argue with me next week. That's fine. I don't mind. Okay? All I'm saying is there's a picture there of... <coughs> This is, there's treasure to be opened in old places which we think are fellow, that are, there's nothing there more for me. It's, I, I know it all. Go and open it up again. We need the word. If Jesus Christ needs the word, how much more do we need it? If there's, if there's, 
if there's wealth in it, if there's strength in it. The armor of God says, use the word. It's, it's your attacking element. If you don't have the word, you have a problem. Go and get it. It is so, so vital. Go and get it. All right, so that was just my little bit about the word. I didn't want to say too much more about it. The next one I want to touch on, and it's, it's not going to take long. The next one I'm going to touch on is prayer. Um, last, last week when we were at the LTT, there's a short, short little guy called Sean McKay. And at our home group, we, we listened to his preach. He did a 15-minute preach. And he just had two words as his title. Please pray. And it was, if, if you can, if you're on the web, go and download it. It's actually 17 minutes. Just go and listen to it. And it's, just go and speak to your God. Just go and speak to Him and be honest with Him. Don't try and be the wise guy. Don't try and, and pray to make the prayer rhyme properly. The words don't clash. Don't get tangled up in your head about how am I putting out the Trinity in this prayer? Is it God the Father, Jesus, Lord Jesus, the Holy Spirit? Which one am I calling on when? Don't worry about that. He's your Father. Don't worry about it. He wants to hear your heart's cry. He then, he then quotes, in that, in that preacher, he quotes Psalm 18. In Psalm 18, um, David is crying out and he says, I cry out to you, Lord, that you would hear, your ears would hear my cry. Psalm 18, go and read it. It's a fantastic psalm. That your ears would hear my cry. And then he says, and then you answered me, Lord. You send an arrow of fire into the ground. The nostrils, the breath of your nostrils opens up the breath of your nostrils. The exhalation of God's breath. Just, just do that. Just that. You know, it's not very powerful. Opens the water. Scours the ground down to the bottom. You can see the base of the sea. That's the power of the God that we worship. He says, and you have sent lightning bolts to, to help me, to save me, etc., etc., etc. But it came out of a, a deep place of David's. He said, Lord, help me. Cry out. And I wonder sometimes, do we cry out? How much time do we spend praying? Good analogy, this guy is reckoning there's, there's some, some pastors who, who, who can, and a push can make it past two minutes. <laughs> can make it past two minutes of prayer. The guy goes to, he alluded to a guy who got sent to, to India. So there was a, a, a prophetic lady in India, so he asked for a word from her, and she said, I see that that God is very happy with you because you spend an hour with Him every day. Make it two. And when he said that, he said his whole life has changed forever since. He couldn't get it to two, but his whole life had changed ever since. I'm not saying go for two hours. I'm saying if your time at the moment is two minutes, let's make it four. If your time at the moment is ten minutes, let's make it twenty. But spend time speaking to your Lord. Prayer is... And, and uncomplicated. The cry of your heart. Not, you know, you also get these preachy prayers. Sometimes I pray for Tracy and it's like I'm preaching to her. It's like not like her, you know. She, we all know what I'm talking about, you know. We sit outside here in the, in the gang and we pray before church and it's like, our oh, Father, give us all strength. Give us courage. Father, let us remember. And, and it's like, hey, who, who, who are you trying to impress here? You know, who, who are you talking to? Father, would the people see their sins, Father? Father, would the young people know to stay away from sexual temptation, Lord? And it's all young people standing around you. It's like, hey, Drew, what are you trying to say? You know, come on. Let's just pray to God. Let's pray to our Father. It's an intimacy that I'm asking for. Proper prayer. Go, go read Matthew 6. Our Father, we better know who we're speaking to. Our Father, whom art in heaven. Are we, do we shake and tremble when we pray? Do we remember this is God in heaven? Who by the breath of his nose opens up the seas. Is it, just remember that. Then what do we want to ask from him? You know, I just, just my advice, let's just do this praying thing properly. You know, I, I'm going to take a couple of examples now. Um, and we, and, and, and we, we all know about them. But, but my, 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 my request is, let's just pray. And let's be honest in our prayer with God. Lord, when, we, when we've sinned, let's be honest in our prayer with God. If you look at David, David does the terrible. He, 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 he beds this woman, kills that woman's husband, 
And then Nathan says to him, hey, Brew, you're messing around here. You can't do that. You've bedded this woman. You've killed her husband. Straight away, straight away, David says, forgive me. I have sinned against you, Father, and nobody else. He's not worried about his shame amongst the people in the country. He's not worried about the shame in the palace. He's not worried about the skinner backer. He's worried about how he sinned against God. That's the intimacy that David had with God. Now I ask myself the question, do we have that intimacy with God? Do we not just come before him and say, Lord, don't let me be exposed. Lord, help me. Uh, don't let them find out about these dealings. Lord, forgive me. David didn't do any of that. He said, Father, I've sinned against you. I'm not worried about the rest of the people. I've sinned against you. He was honest. And what, did David, what did the Lord say? He was a man after his own heart. David was a man after his own heart because he was in rapport with him. It wasn't worried about this. Yes, he'd done a man in. He'd killed a man. He'd committed adultery. He'd, he'd done this woman in. But he knew that he'd, he'd actually sinned against God. That's the honest place I'm asking us to get into when we do go to pray. I'm going to take, take us to a couple of, uh, couple of examples now of, of prayer. But just another one. You know, it's been said before, water is wet. Water is wet. The wetness that comes with water is intrinsic, integral, indivisible, unavoidable if you're dealing with water. So here's another fact of life. Christians pray. All right? The praying of Christians come with be, comes with being a Christian. It's intrinsic, integral, indivisible, unavoidable if you're a Christian. So let's do it properly. Water is wet. Christians pray. Guess what? Let's do it properly. Let's do it honestly. I just want us to turn, if you can, Second Chronicles 20. It's just the story of Jehoshaphat. Now, Jehoshaphat, somewhere I read in this Bible, he had like a million, he had, he had an army of a million people. An army of a million people, Jehoshaphat had. So he finds these, and you're reading that First Chronicles 20, or Second Chronicles 20, Jehoshaphat is threatened by the hordes coming against him. He's got an army of a million, and he's threatened by these hordes that are coming against him. Okay? And he's most alarmed. I'm just going to turn there quickly. It says here, the words that are used is, Shaken, Jehoshaphat prayed. He went to God for help and ordered a nationwide fast. The country of Judah united in seeking God's help. They came from all the cities of Judah to pray to God. So he had this million-man army which he was shaken about because there were people coming up to, to fight against him. So he declares a, a fast for the, whole, for the whole of Judah. The whole of Judah unites behind him on this fast. And, and we all know the rest of the story. If you, we can carry on reading it. I'm just going to touch on the Spirit of God moving him. Attention, everyone, all of you from out of town, all of you from Jerusalem and you, King Jehoshaphat, God's word, don't be afraid. Don't pay any mind to this vandal horde. This is God's war, not yours. This is Jehaziel. In, the, in about verse, this thing doesn't have lack of verse, in about verse 15. All right? So it's God's war. The prophetic word comes, it's God's war. But they, they, they went and they fasted, they prayed, but, but we've been in those places. All of us have been in those places. We don't have, our business is not going well, our children are very sick, our, our relationships are going down the tubes. So we've all been in that desperate place. So there's God answering a guy in a desperate place. They then go to war. Joseph had put the, 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 the choir in front of the war, and the next day, everyone kill, all his enemies kill each other. They ambush each other. God, God ambushes them, and then they don't even lift a finger. All they do is they sing praise to God, the way he, he delivered them. But, but, but he was, Jehoshaphat was shaken to his core. It says here, he was shaken, he prayed. Okay, so that's, that's Jehoshaphat. I just want us to go quickly through the, the story of, uh, of Nehemiah, because you also see a man there. And I'm not going to spread out over a couple of chapters. Um, but I'm going to go through the lessons quickly and I'm going to give the verses. Nehemiah wants to rebuild the, 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 the um, city walls in Jerusalem. First thing he does in chapter 1, verse 4 to 11, he asks for help by approaching the king. But he says, Lord, how must I approach this man? That's the first thing he does. So, you know, we, we, we could have a business that we're busy running. We could have a a decision we're having to make, Father, which way do I go? But this is exactly what Nehemiah does. During the conversation with the king, so now imagine you're applying for, for, for a, a contract. 
I'm going to take it, you want to supply computers to ESCOM. During the discussion with ESCOM, the guy who's, who, who's the chief procurement officer is speaking to you. And you're thinking, geez, man, I could get this job. I could, this, could save my, this could save my family, this could save my business. During that discussion, Jehoshaphat speaks to, the, speaks to God. He says, Lord, what must I say to this man? Lord, give me wisdom. Do we do the same thing? In the middle of the conversation, do, are we doing that thing? Father, what do you want us to say? Father, how do you want us to attack this problem? Father, how do we impress upon this man that we have the capacity to do this job? It's a prayer. In chapter 4, carrying on, we see Nehemiah asking God to deal with the mockers. He's got guys who are mocking him and saying, you'll never ever get this, you'll never get this wall built again. Nehemiah says, very simply, he says, Lord, you deal with this. I don't have time for it. I'm organizing workers. I'm organizing bricks. I'm organizing cement. I'm organizing blades. I'm organizing swords for us to protect ourselves. You deal with this. How often do we do that? We set up a business. Everyone says to us, that can never work. So what do we do? We say, why can't it ever work? What are the problems? And all we should be saying is, Father, you've, you, you've put this business in front of us. You've asked us to find our position. Greg prayed that this morning. Find our position. Find our niche here in Neisner. And then move it forward. But Lord, you put me here. You've given me this business. But now this guy says it can't work. Father, you look after this thing. Father, you address this issue. Father, if I need to turn my mind to it, if I need to put my energy into it, please come back to me on it. God will answer those prayers. Later on, we, in that same chapter we see in chapter 4, he, he prays that, that, that God would protect them while they work and that they protect themselves. He doesn't just do nothing. He gives everyone a sword. He says, you, you, you stand here, you protect, you carry on working. After six hours, change. You work, you protect. That's what they do. They stand on the wall and they protect themselves. But they ask God's protection upon them at the same time. Carrying on in, verse six, in chapter 6, we get the same thing. Once again, Lord, strengthen me. I'm, I'm, I'm responding to these threats. Lord, strengthen me. In the middle of this business decision that I'm making or in the middle of this business that I'm busy putting together, in the middle of trying to establish a business, Lord, you need to strengthen me. I can't do this by myself. You've told me I need to be here. You've told me what road I need to walk. But, Father, strengthen me. I believe you. I've got courage for you. I've got strength, Lord, but I need your strength again. Nehemiah does that continuously. In chapter 13, the same, same thing happens. He asks God to deal with his enemies and, his, and their evil plans. Continuously, also in Nehemiah, if you go read it, in chapter 5, in chapter 13, and chapter 22, No chapter 22 in Nehemiah. <laughs> really now, in chapter 5 and in chapter 13, he keeps on saying to God, remember me, Lord. Why does he say, remember me, Lord? Because he wants his motives to be pure. He wants to say to God, God, my motives are pure. Keep me pure. Keep me so that it's not, please hide my problems, hide my mistakes, please hide my stuff from people. It says, no, Lord, you're the one that I, that I honor. You're the one that I obey. You're the one that gives me direction in this place. Let me stick to what you have given me. Let me keep my eyes pinned on you. That's what we do when we, when we pray. I just, in, just on this prayer thing, I want to set up a small business here in, in Nazna. So I pray about it. Like, like Greg spoke about this morning, I get direction that this is where I need to go. And it's not something I've ever done before in my life. I hear people saying, geez, man, what are you doing? You're crazy. It's in Nisner, in the Southern Cape, even miles from any market. So I speak to some guy. How's this? In the late 70s, he sets up a business in George that produces asparagus for Europe. In the late 70s. Within 72 hours of cutting the asparagus spear on the farm in George, it's sold in a shop in France. In the late 70s. And then I hear, yes, but, but, but Wayne, you can't do that. And I think, Jesus, Lord, who am I listening to? Who am I surrounding myself with? Where are my eyes pinned? I'm not saying be blind to the problems. I'm not saying discard good advice. But I'm saying, who's leading you? And we'll get to that just now. We'll get to that now. Okay. Then I just want to touch on, on the standing part. 
It won't be very much longer. I, I have one scripture I go back to all the time on the stand. Can anybody guess what it is? Huh? No, 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 no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't like lentils. No, but it's close. it's close. It's in the Old Testament. I have a scripture I always go back to on standing, and it's, I think it's in, in Joshua, Joshua 1, verses 1 to 8. I'm going to read it, read it just out of the, the uh, Message Bible as well. After the death of Moses, the servant of God, God spoke to Joshua, Moses' assistant. Moses, my servant, is dead. Get going. Cross this Jordan River, you and all the people. Cross to the country I'm giving to the people of Israel. I'm giving you every square inch of the land you set your foot on, just as I promised Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon east to the great river, the Euphrates River, all the Hittite country, and then west to the great sea. It's all yours. All your life, no one will be able to hold out against you. In the same way I was with Moses, I'll be with you. I won't give up on you. I won't leave you. Strength, courage. You're going to lead this people to inherit the land that I promised to give their ancestors. Give it everything you have, heart and soul. Make sure you carry out the revelation that Moses commanded you, every bit of it. Don't get off track, either left or right, so as to make sure you get to where you're going. Don't for a minute let this book of the revelation be out of your mind. Ponder and meditate on it day and night, making sure you practice everything written in it. Then you'll get where you're going. Then you'll succeed. Haven't I commanded you? strength and courage. Don't be timid. Don't get discouraged. God, your God, is with you every step you take. And I think the devil will have us not stand. If you read that passage in Ephesians 6, it speaks about standing. It says you put on this armor and then you stand. And you tie it all together with prayer in the Spirit. But you're asked to stand. This thing here in Joshua is exactly the same. Stand. Where you put your feet, God has given you. So make sure that where you're standing, God has said, you, that's where you need to be. If you've got that confirmation, then stand. Don't stand and then, hey, there's another opportunity over there, so I'll move. No, no, no. God's not looking for people who go left and who go right. He's looking for people who will stand or go forward. But it takes strength, it takes courage, it takes perse perseverance, it takes determination. Exactly the qualities we've spoken about now now of being a soldier, of fighting for your inheritance. You have to stand. You've got to sometimes say, Ooh, Lord, I'm going to dig in there. I can't go forward, but I'm not going backwards, I'm not going left, I'm not going right, but I'm going to stand here just for the time being. Then I'm going to take a step forward, and I'm going to walk into my inheritance. It takes strength. It takes courage. Nobody... Some guy I know he turned down a, a massive job offer a couple of weeks ago. Massive job offer to stay in Nazla. Other guys are saying, what on earth are you doing? He's been called to here, so he's standing here. I know people in this congregation in exactly the same position. They've been called to here, so they're going to stand here. But we've got to be saying, Lord, you said I'm going to be standing here. I'm not going left, I'm not going right. I'm having courage that I'm going to stand here. That's not the only thing that we get told to do. We get told to take the word and keep it here. Meditate on it. Uh, that word meditate, in, in this context, I think about it like a cow. <laughs> so please excuse me. I think about it like a cow chewing its cud. A cow's got seven sub stomachs or something, five or seven stomachs. So it brings up what it's eaten. It brings up what it's eaten. And it takes, by rechewing and rechewing and rechewing, produces milk. I've always thought they're clever. Green grass, white milk, clever cows. But <laughs> we've been digressing a bit. I'm just thinking that. That word, he's asking us to take that word close, to put it in here, and to re-chew it, regurgitate it, rework it. But we've got to get the word in the first place. The word's got to be deep-seated inside us. It doesn't help we don't read our Bible. It doesn't help we're not saying to God, hey, give me guidance, what must I read? It's got to be in here. And then we regurgitate on it. We work it. We rework it. Say, Lord, what are you meaning? What are you meaning? What is the nuance here? What is the context here? Why do you want me to do this? That's what he's asking us to do. He's saying, stay true to it. He's saying, don't go left, don't go right. Stay true to where I've called you. And be strong and courageous. So, so uh, Joshua goes to the Israelites and he says, get ready, we're going over the Jordan. Yeah? Make ready, take a few days, get ready, we're going across the Jordan. You know what they say to him? 
Guess what they say to him? They say, but we'll follow you. Just you be strong and courageous. It's not God telling him to be strong and courageous. The people that he's leading are saying to him, just be strong and courageous. The families that we're leading, the businesses that we're leading, we've been asked to be strong and courageous. I think if you read that, just keep on reading it and you go back to it again and read it in different versions, you also see how committed the people, how committed Joshua is. I think the comment he says here, give it your all, you know. Um, I won't leave you, you're going to hear it. Give it everything you have, heart and soul. Now, if, if you're going to be tossed and turned, we all know the scripture in James. If you're going to be tossed and turned like a wind on the sea, don't expect God to answer your, 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 your prayers. Because you undecided what, where you want to be. You, Lord, help me, please. Okay, well, he has a job opportunity in Joburg. Lord, help me, please. Well, he has a job opportunity in Nazareth. Lord, help me, please. Which one do I take? Well, where must you be? Don't answer that question. Go and find out from God where he wants you seated. And then when you pray to him, you know what you're praying for. Not just, Lord, provision, I'll go work in Joburg. If he wants you in Joburg, go to Joburg. No issue. Please, I'm not holding people in Nazareth. I'm not chasing people away from Nazareth. I'm just saying, wherever God wants you to be, to be batting in His kingdom, that's where you need to be. I'm just, just landing this thing just quickly. My feeling is that the tough and noisy boasters aren't going to cut it in this fight. Guys who front up, who make a lot of noise, who claim that everything's good, aren't going to make it in this fight. The option takers aren't going to cut it in this fight. The guys who are always looking for, where's my plan B? Where's my other option? Where's my other escape route? Wayne Rose, one of them. Always looking for a hidey hole, for a back door. The option takers aren't going to cut it in this fight. They're quietly determined, filled with God's word, praying minute by minute. Committed kingdom growers will make it. By God's mighty spirit and power. <coughs> no other way. And I just want to pray for us as we close. I just want to read a, one last scripture. Second Corinthians 10 verse 4. It just says, For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. So we can do all this, but we can't do it by ourselves. No matter how much word I put into myself, I can memorize the whole Torah. No matter how much prayer I put in and how, much, how my knees bleed because I'm praying to God, if I don't have His power behind this thing, it's not going to work. That's just going to be my prayer this morning. All right? Thanks for giving me the time to share.